photography. And I do think I want to go ahead and get started. Um, I know we're still waiting for people to join the meeting um, and we are recording. So if anybody, any of your team members um, or coworkers um, aren't able to join, we are going to have the recording and I'll send that out after we're done today. Uh, but I do, like I said, want to go ahead and get us kicked off. Um, I'm Shelby Fiegel. I'm the director of the Center for Community and Economic Development at the University of Central Arkansas. And as I was sharing uh, before I got started, this is um, this marketing tips for small businesses is a part of our community conversations virtual series um, in partnership with the Arkansas State University Delta Center, which I think we got Frankie film on. If you want to give away Frankie. Um, the Arkansas Economic Development Commission, Community Development Br Division, Kristen and Brittany are on with us, um, and then Intergy Arkansas and Tandy's on if Tandy wants to give a wave. Um, so this has been a really fun partnership. We've hosted this um, several times since the beginning of the pandemic and hope to even continue doing these beyond um, when we get back to normal after COVID. Um, and this session, we are super excited. We're hosting Retail Strategy, so Clay Craft and Jen Gregory are gonna be speaking with us today. Um, I know Clay and Jen really well now. We've done a couple of projects with them and they are amazing. They're experts. Um, we're so happy and excited to have them. Um, and so, like I said, we do encourage interactivity. So if you have any questions um, throughout the presentation, please feel free to put those in the chat. Um, I know Jen and Clay wanna answer any questions you have. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Clay and Jen. All right, Shelby. Well, thank you so much for the, for the wonderful introduction and good morning, everyone. Uh, appreciate you carving out times out of your busy day to, to join us, but we're, we're really excited to, to speak with you all today and, and share a little bit uh, of some of our tips and tricks that we're using in the industry and, and maybe how you can leverage it for your community or, or your, your small business. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, Shelby, I've got I've got three different screens. Can y'all can y'all see my screen there? Perfect. It all it always gets funky when when you have all the different screens going. But uh, there we go. And again, my, my name is Clay Craft. I'm I'm vice president of client services for retail strategies. I've, been with the company for seven years now, uh, work primarily in, in the Midwest, but I, I, I serve our, our clients in the state of Arkansas, work, work directly with the communities to, to really help uh, their retail recruitment efforts. Uh, we, we've got some of, our, some of our partners on the call today and I appreciate, appreciate them joining us, um, but we are, we're, we're very excited about what we're doing. Um, I, I do believe that Jen has joined us as well, but Jen is our president of Downtown Strategies. She's got a 13 year career in community development and, and really specializes in focusing in downtown, re, downtown revitalization and, and strategies to help bolster your, your downtown. So today we're gonna to talk about uh, several things. Uh, we're gonna give a little bit of overview about who we are, what we do. Uh, I'm gonna give you a, a high level of, of industry trends. What, what's happening in the retail world? There's a lot of big and scary words that are out there. We're gonna kinda, kinda help you dissect through the noise. Um, we're going to get a, give an update on, on COVID-19 and how that's affected and, and you know, the long lasting effects of COVID-19 in, in the retail. And, um, you know, it, it's not all bad, uh, believe it or not. Um, then Jen's going to walk through six steps uh, to implement your omni-channel strategy. Uh, and then I'm going to give you 10 tips to position your city for retail recruitment. So who, who are we? Retail strategies, uh, we, we were born out of a, a out of a, uh, Retail broker to development house. Uh, our 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 partners saw that 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 you know they were in a city council meeting one day and they saw that you know the developer was talking to the city and the city was talking to the, to the developer and they might as well have been talking two different languages. So our 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 fir firm was born to really bridge the gap um, and 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 kind of pull back the veil on on retail recruitment and and really teach cities and, and assist cities how they can how they can recruit retail to their markets. We currently work in about 150 cities across the United States, uh, on 30, 32 states. Um, we have we have offices all, all across the Southeast, uh, but we've, we've, the company's been around for, for about 10 years. Um, so, you know, is, your, is, is retail recruitment a focus of your organization? 
um, you know, I'm here to tell you that that if it's not, it needs to be because because I can I can promise you your your neighboring or com, com, uh, uh, competing markets, you know, they are making it a a, a focus. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of effort uh, for economic development has been focused around industrial projects and things like that. But but we'll we'll talk about a little bit about how you know small retail wins can can really add up to make a huge economic impact to your bottom line. So now we're going to do a little bit of quiz. Uh, going to give everybody a couple of seconds to, to think about this. But, but on average, how many jobs would you say the average quick service restaurant can bring to a community? Any ideas in your head? 15. So if you think about, you know, and that's really at a bare minimum. That's, that's 15 full-time equivalent jobs. Um, anytime a quick service restaurant comes into your community. So if we think about an industrial project bringing, you know, 100 to 200 people, uh, you know, jobs into a community, that's, that's great and fantastic. But we, we want to focus on the retail impact and, you know, just a small QSR bringing 15 jobs, you, you bring a grocery store that could be, you know, anywhere between 50 and 100 jobs, uh, Target, Home Depot. I mean, you know, those, those types of wins really add up to your community. The next one, what percentage of jobs in the United States are retail or retail related? 25%. So one in every four job in the United States is retail related. So obviously retail is very important really to our overall economy and, and to your local economy. What percentage of small businesses are categorized as small business? 98%. Almost every business in the United States is a is a small business, and that's really you know 500 500 uh, employees and below is considered small business. But obviously, small business is the backbone of of America. So, what is the largest consumer group in the United States? That's millennials. So, millennial, and that is important because even if you don't have millennials in your community, the the way that millennials shop, eat, dine. They're, they're really experiential animals, if you will. So really retailers and, and really industries overall are having to cater towards millennials. Um, and and it, we're seeing a trickle down effect really in, in almost every sector. What percentage of retail sales are online? This has gone up a bit in the last year. We're up to 15% of all retail sales are online. Now that that the growth rate on that is, is exploding. If I would have showed you this slide maybe a year ago, it would have been eight or 9%. So we've almost doubled. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has really pulled forward uh, the retail industry and, 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 and e-commerce really probably five or six years into the future. A lot of the things that were that were gonna happen down the road really just out of necessity got, got drug into 2020 and 2021. So, so 15% of all retail sales are online. But here's the good news. What percentage of shoppers still say they prefer to shop in store? 78%. So 78% of all consumers say that they still want to touch, they want to feel, they want to try on that shirt before they buy it, they want to sit on that couch before they buy it. So I'm here to tell you that, that, that it's scary out there you know, people are saying that retail is going away, brick and mortar retail is going away, but I promise you it's not. It's just changing. And we'll talk about how it's changing a little bit later. So blank is the practice of combining brick and mortar and online presence to create a seamless shopping. Omnichanneling. So omnichanneling is the seamless integration between bricks and clicks. So, so think, about a, think about a retailer like Walmart or Home Depot. They have a larger SKU on their website or their app um, than, than they do in their actual brick and mortar store. And that's really to, to drive sales into their physical location. So the number one challenge retailers face, whether you're a small business or Walmart, is getting people in your doors. And omni-channeling is help bridging the gap uh, to, to get retailers in, into, or to get consumers into, your, into the retail locations. But the retail apocalypse, I mean, that this headline has been, is, has been on the forefront ever since I've been in the industry. Um, you know, retail apocalypse is, is such a, you know, misnomer for what's happening. It's really just a changing uh, shift in consumer behavior and, and really how, how we prefer to do business. So, you know, if you think about, you know, the, you know, cyclically, if you look over the, the last 100 years, you know, the, the, the top company in the world really changes constantly. So at one point, Sears Holdings was the largest retailer in the United States. Sears now is just a, a you know, a real estate company. They, they hardly have any any locations open. So, you know, as, as, as that 
model shifts, um, you know, we see Amazon really taking over, taking over the Sears model where, it, where it's the online Sears catalog, if you will. So, so things are just changing. A great representation of this is, is really think about your mobile device. We, every single one of us have one. It's probably a smartphone. So if you think about all the things, I just want you to close your eyes and picture on the right, all of these things that 15 years ago, you would have gone into Radio Shack to buy these things. So GPS, you know, your flashlight, you wake up to your alarm clock on your phone, you, you read your news, you watch videos, and the list goes on. That is now con contained into one device, and that's your, that's your mobile phone. So just, it's just a great representation of the types of consolidation that's happened in the retail world. Uh, but through this and, and really just, you know, during COVID, um, you know, innovation is, has rapidly been adopted and changed in, in the retail world. So, you know, the, 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 the pickup, you know, whereas like you, you, know, you can buy your groceries at Walmart, pick them up, you know, that was being tested in a lot of stores before the pandemic. But really during the pandemic, Walmart really started rolling those out to every location. Um, the advent of the, the, the you know, the, the ship shopper or the Instacart shopper has really picked up. Um, you know, restaurants specifically are, are driving sales natively through their app. Starbucks is now doing 25% of all of their sales through their app. So, so retailers are really encouraging. And that's, that's kind of what Jen's going to talk about is, is, you know, as a small business, you know, the, really the importance of getting your small business online because so many of those, so, you know, the, the national retailers are teaching the consumers that, hey, you have to go to our app, you have to go to our website to purchase our goods. So it's very important for small businesses to fall in line. And, and adopt that same technology. But as an as a overall group, you know, look at the United States, our, our square footage that we retail compared to the next closest. Um, you know, we are, we are to a large degree over retail as a, as a nation. Um, so a lot of retailers are really right-sizing their footprints, if you will. So it's not about these large gargantuan formats anymore. It's really about focusing on the right size footprint, reducing overhead and, and creating that one-off shopping experience that, that consumers like and enjoy. But again, COVID-19, you know, has forever changed the, the, the retail industry. Um, some, some good, some bad, uh, but we've seen a lot of innovation that's really going to challenge and, and really propel our industry in, into the future. And I think, I think Jen may be on now. Jen, if you're on, I'll let you, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Clay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for having us. And Clay, thank you for walking us through that. Um, so at this point, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, those national trends um, that Clay identified. How can that be um, really determined in a way that will help your business? You know, how is that information important to you? Um, and why is that information important? So let's start first by in the chat, if you guys could just leave a brief comment about, you know, how has COVID-19 affected your community's small business? Um, I know some of you might be business owners, some of you are community leaders. Um, has it affected your small businesses, do you think? Um, and if you have anything to add there, I'll give everybody a second to, um, to put that in the chat. And then we're going to look at specifically in just a few slides, you know, how has it affected small businesses throughout um, throughout Arkansas as a whole in terms of revenue and numbers. So some comments that we're seeing some empty stores, restaurants have gone out of business, uh, dips in revenue. So this is something that we're really seeing, of course, across the country, every state is different, but across the board, every state has seen dips in small business revenue. Um, really some good comments here that we're seeing. Um, they're having issues finding help. Um, some of them have moved online and have seen gains. They've been forced to adapt and try new things. So great feedback. Thank you guys for, for leaving that. And all of those things are things that we'll talk about. No stock inside the stores. Yes, definitely something that I've seen as well. Um, I don't know if, um, Shelby, if you can make me a host to advance the slides. Um, if not, though, Clay, I might have to depend on you to advance them. Yeah, I'm happy to. I think you're a host. But, uh, and Jen, yeah, and you should be a co-host, so you should. Okay. okay, let's see. I think everybody else has to keep their mouse still, maybe, to give me um, 
Okay. Well, that's okay. Don't. Um, so Clay, I'll let you help yeah. me if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. So let's look at first, you know, what has this, the pandemic uh, meant and what has it done for small businesses? And then we'll come down um, and talk about how businesses can implement these omni-channel strategies. So first of all, on this slide, we see uh, pre-pandemic that retail sales were at an all-time high. You know, it really piggybacks nicely to Clay slides um, talking about, um, you know, this retail apocalypse. Is it real? We've been hearing a lot about it. Um, so before the pandemic, retail sales were at an all time high. Um, we see that in the blue, you know, those bars are um, higher than than any other month or year previously. Um, and on the next slide. Uh, we see that when the pandemic happened, there was a very big change, of course, uh, but it, it differed depending on what industry your business or what category your business would fall under. So let's take a look at that. We see that all of these colors, you know, all of these categories were trending along pretty similarly. And then in February of last year, we saw a stark change. Obviously, clothing stores were affected heavily. You know, a lot of us weren't buying clothes. We were sitting at home, um, followed by food service and drinking places. That's restaurants. You know, we saw that they too had a big dip. A lot of restaurants were closed. Um, and then in blue, you see kind of the total retail sales that there was a dip, but we see that it's coming back up and almost to those pre pandemic numbers. But then we see food and beverage stores. By that, we mean grocery stores big gains, right? People were not going out to eat as much. They were cooking, they were staying home. So depending on the type of business that you are, you've definitely seen a different effect. Um, but overall across the board, definite negative experiences. Um, all right, on the next slide, we see that Yes, uh, those sales are coming back up. They're almost to pre-crisis levels. Certainly these trillions of dollars that have been infiltrated into the economy through the stimulus bills have helped that. Um, we have seen that with the CARES Act, those initial stimulus dollars, people really held on to those. You know, they put them in their savings account or they paid off debt. They weren't really sure what the future was going to be. But with the subsequent stimulus checks, we have seen um, that those numbers have um, really, or that those checks have really been spent. Um, I actually was in an airport yesterday and saw that, you know, the airports are, are literally bursting at the seams. You know, I've been traveling quite a bit throughout the pandemic. I don't remember it being this busy um, in quite a while. So people are back ready to spend those dollars, which is good for businesses across the board. All right, next we look at, you know, how has this pandemic affected small businesses in Arkansas? So let's take a look at these two charts. The first one um, shows numbers of uh, total number of businesses open um, compared to January 2020. So these numbers are as of the end of March. Um, so you can see that on that top bar, um, that navy blue color in the middle shows that there are 23% fewer businesses open today than as compared to the beginning of the pandemic. So that's a big difference. You know, we noticed some folks in the in the chat box said that they saw empty stores. Well, this certainly um, you know relates to that. We see that the leisure and hospitality industry obviously was hit the hardest with 41% of those businesses closed as compared to the start of the pandemic. You know, Arkansas has some beautiful tourism resources, some beautiful natural resources that obviously have been hard hit by the pandemic. And then we see the retail and transportation category down about 25%. Um, so those businesses obviously closed as compared to the start of the pandemic, even despite those federal resources that have been made available. But then let's look at small business revenue in total. Actually, yeah, thank you, Clay. So that bottom graph, um, if you'll go back one slide, Clay. Thank you so much. Um, that bottom graph shows small business revenue as a whole for the state of Arkansas. Again, we're looking at the end of March as compared to um, the start of the pandemic. And you see that overall small business revenue is up just a little bit. It's up about 5% across the board. 
in Arkansas. Um, leisure and hospitality still way down in revenue. We do anticipate that to pick up and you can see it's trending upwards. Um, and then retail businesses uh, overall are seeing an uptick of about 6%. So really good news that even though a lot of businesses have closed and that certainly uh, negatively affects communities and, and our neighbors, but we are seeing that that spending power um, being held local. People are spending money and they're spending them with small businesses. So some good news here. And then we look at, you know, Main Street America. Many of you might have uh, Main Street programs in your communities. Um, Main Street America did a survey in April of last year, really kind of in the midst of, of the worst parts of the pandemic early on. And we saw that over 60% of small businesses did not have an online presence prior to the pandemic. Um, so that is really what hits home for us and why this topic is so important of getting those businesses online. Like Clay said, just to kind of tie it all together, online shopping is going up, you know, not as, as far up as, as some people thought it would be, but it's definitely increasing. Um, and, and businesses in, in Arkansas and across the country, by and large, those small businesses don't have an online presence. So how can we really close that gap and encourage our small businesses to get online? And that's what we're going to talk about today. So on this slide, you know, I, I'd like to point out kind of closing the gap. And Clay mentioned that, and, and, and I'd like to reiterate that as well. You can see that per category, um, when you look on the left, uh, those percentages in purple are the percent um, uh, of expenditures that take place in a brick and mortar store, whereas the green percentage um, is, you know, the percentage that's done um, online. And so, you know, we uh, heard from the International Council of Shopping Centers that they projected online sales to go up to 25% by 2021 because of the pandemic. Um, but that hasn't happened. It's growing, but not to the extent that we thought. And overall, 81% of all retail sales um, you know, still go through stores. We see, you know, see that number really um, holding true. And so how can businesses in your communities really close that gap to have both a brick and mortar presence and that digital presence? So one thing I'd, I'd like to hear from you all, and feel free to put your comments in the chat, you know, are your community small businesses really online or do they simply have a Facebook presence? You know, when we talk to communities and say, are your businesses online? They say, sure, they have a Facebook page and they post occasionally. Well, that's really not what we mean. And we'll get into that a little deeper. But before we advance, let us know, are your businesses online truly? Do they have an, an e-commerce platform? platform? Uh, are they utilizing social media? Um, are all of those channels really talking to one another? Or are people really just, you know, having a Facebook page and considering that their online presence? So we'll give everybody a, um, a minute to let us know. We're hearing that one business um, that upped their e-commerce during the pandemic has tripled their sales. Awesome feedback. Um, really appreciate you sharing that, Ellie. Most just use social media and don't understand that there is a difference. Great point. You know, Jen, I've, I've seen some of my, my communities I work with that in, in the Midwest that, you know, they have these, these, these mom and pop restaurants that, that didn't do curbside, didn't do takeout and didn't do drive-through. Some of them went to drive-through only and, and doubled and tripled their sales. So so we're, you know, anecdotally, you know, I, I do believe that Chick-fil-A is going to open their indoor at some point, but Chick-fil-A will 100% start doing stores now that do not have indoor dining because their their sales are going through the roof. They're way more efficient. They can serve a lot more customers. Um, they, they need less land where, where land is becoming a premium. So so I think that's one of the things also we mentioned curbside, but I, but I think there's going to be a big disruption in, in the mom and pop, you know, your, your local favorite restaurant, um, you know, I think, I think they have an ability to, to kind of latch on if they haven't already done this. Thank you, Clay. That's a great point. Um, 
great point of, of especially watching what those national retailers are doing and modeling after that. And we're going to talk about that um, a little bit more in just a second. Thank you all for these good comments. Keep them coming. Well, let's get into to really what is omnichannel retailing and how can your businesses implement it? Also, you know, important to note, this is not just a concept for retail. Um, I actually just met with a group. Um, I'm actually in, in Texas today and met with a group of small businesses just earlier this morning and had some nonprofit administrators um, at our session. And so for those of you that have economic development agencies, chambers of commerce, you too can implement some of these strategies. So this is not just for retailers but for everyone. Um, so what is omnichannel retail? Really, what does it mean? And someone said, um, one of the comments that was made was, you know, they're using different channels, but not uh, to the full extent. And that's really what we mean by omnichannel. So let's go through kind of these different concepts. First, we have traditional retail, the good old fashioned brick and mortar store. Uh, you know, we're familiar with that. That's really where everything started. Then we did start to see, you know, kind of in the, the mid 2000s, um, stores saying, yeah, I need a web presence, you know, I need a website. Um, and I, you know, some implemented the ability for um, customers to shop with them online. And especially in recent years, that has skyrocketed with the evolution of Shopify and, and places like that. So that's really what we consider e-commerce. Someone could go on your website and purchase something, and that's great. Then came the, the notion of multi-channeling and really as social media became uh, so prevalent and a part of daily life, we started to see retailers implement you know, multi-channeling, which is really various disconnected channels for customers to use independently. So we saw retailers uh, push out information to all of these channels, right? They have a brick and mortar store, they might post something on their social media and they have that e-commerce perspective. And so to them, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm omni-channeling. But really what the consumers are looking for, and going back to that point that Clay made about the millennials being the largest consumer group in America, what millennials are looking for is an integrated, seamless experience across multiple devices and touch points. So when you look at this kind of circle, I want you to think about the consumer being in the middle. So not only are they receiving information from all of these various uh, touch points and channels, but those channels are receiving information from the consumer. So it's consumer driven, it's a customized retail experience. So on the next slide, we really detail what is omnichannel retail, and I won't read all of this to you, but I want us to focus on customization. Um, this is a modern approach um, that focuses on designing a cohesive user experience for customers at every touch point. So it's customized, it's unique to your brand. And really what this creates is a brand ecosystem, you know, for, for your specific identity of your company, of your organization, or of your business. Um, all of these different touch points are available. You know, we see the phone, we see um, a shopping cart, you know, brick and mortar, email, um, utilizing links, even utilizing text services, you know, SMS, text messaging, website, blog posts, um, all of these different elements existing seamlessly in the digital realm to provide the customer with a, a, a unique experience. So, you know, how can we implement that? That seems really difficult and a lot to take in, um, but it's really not. We've broken it down to six steps to implementing this omni-channel strategy, and we're going to go through each of these. So the first step um, on the next slide is data. This is really where it all begins. And so, you know, data is, is having data is worth so much. In fact, there are companies that pay for data. And what we mean by that is customer data. And so the, the number one step here for your business or even for your nonprofit is to start creating, a, a, you know, a database of your customers. If you're a business, uh, a shop owner, um, this all starts with a point of sale system. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of the, the businesses that we work with are utilizing antiquated point of sale systems. Um, they, they know how to use it. They don't want to change. They're afraid it's too expensive and it's too much of a learning curve. But what we know is that, you know, 
uh, systems such as Square Register, Shopify, um, these kind of portals that exist um, for businesses are relatively accessible. Uh, they require you know, a monthly fee and it does, these points of sale systems do all of the things for you that we're gonna talk about in these six steps. So that is absolutely the place to start. If you're a nonprofit, you can start collecting that information um, other ways, but the key is to have that customer data. Um, the second step is create the customer experience, you know, and again, this goes back to millennials. Um, yes, they're technologically savvy and they can purchase items pretty much anywhere they want. But the number one characteristic of millennials is that they crave an experience. Yes, they can buy that, that new blazer online, but they'd rather have a cool experience and a, a chat with their neighbor in the store while doing so, but it's gotta be convenient and it's gotta be easy. And when we talk about omni-channeling, you know, we don't just want to talk about getting people to purchase something online. You know, it's all about nudging the consumer closer to the transaction with every step. And that's what automation can do to really help you. So, uh, you know, a lot of folks, when they hear this, they think, oh, that all sounds great, but I don't have time to do that. Well, the point of sale system does a lot for you and there are great opportunities for automation. And so what we mean by this is, first of all, um, for you to think about the messaging that you want to put out for your customers. Again, we said nudge the customer closer to the point of transaction with every touch point. So that might mean if you're a service-based business or a nonprofit, you know, the ultimate transaction is for them to come into your store or to meet with you in person. But how can you use these digital channels to help nudge them closer to that? And automation is key. Um, there are platforms um, in the marketplace that allow you to pre-post your social media posts. You can schedule them in advance that you're not having to wake up and think every day, what am I going to post on Facebook today? You know, it's very uh, coordinated and strategic. Some elements that can be automated you see on this last point include, you know, your social media posts. Um, also, you know, uh, pop-ups, uh, pop-up windows on your website that will collect email addresses. Again, collecting that data. And then also e-newsletters. You can create them and schedule them in advance with your point of sale system like Shopify or Square. There are templates ready to go for you to use that incorporates all of this information. It incorporates the data that you've collected and it exemplifies that customer experience um, based on the photos that you import. The fourth step is multiple channels. Um, you know, what we don't mean is that everything needs to go online. You still have to really hold true to that brick and mortar presence um, and to that experience that someone can have while purchasing with you or while, um, you know, working with your organization. So you need to work both offline and online. Something that we really encourage is while utilizing the data, you know, if you can look at a map and see where do all of your customers live? Um, then you can know, hey, I might have a large pocket of customers that are in that neighboring community that I never realized. How can you take your services or your merchandise to them through pop-up events, through special targeted social media campaigns and things of this nature? It doesn't have to be complicated. Just look at that data and start making decisions about how to take your brand directly to the customer remembering that still over 75% of purchases are made physically in the store. So you've got to really maintain both of those channels. Next is to allocate resources, you know, and this is the hardest one to get folks to, to get on board with because it doesn't just mean financial resources, it can mean time resources. The automation will help with all of that, but really we know that this can seem daunting. Um, a lot of businesses, though, when they start thinking about this omni-channeling, they think about, okay, well, if I have a Facebook page, an Instagram page, a website that I'm supposed to be posting blog content to, an e-newsletter, and my store, there's no way that I can post unique content on each of those channels, but you don't have to. 
really the goal of omni-channeling is to have one single idea or concept and, and trickle that out a little differently through all of these various channels. So if you're a business, you know, Mother's Day is coming up. Maybe you want to kind of do a Mother's Day promotion or campaign. How can you post on each of your channels strategically, but a little bit differently about the merchandise that you have for mothers or whatever it might be? So don't overcomplicate it really is our biggest recommendation. Allocate the time and the financial resources to get you started to really get that point of sale system going to collect your data and then simplify it through messaging. And then the last step is to deliver on your promises. You know, what we really know is that uh, these millennials, all customers really, we have high expectations. You know, so many of us, um, because we were home for a, an extended period of time, we've become a lot more accustomed to utilizing technology. You know, my grandmother's 90 years old and she finally said, I, I went ahead, I bit the bullet, I ordered my groceries because I had to, you know, I didn't feel safe leaving the house before she was vaccinated and the like. So that those older generations, uh, the greatest generation, for example, and even baby boomers are now more familiar with social media and these digital channels than ever. So it's a must, we have to exist on them. Um, and so delivering on the promise, how can we meet and exceed those expectations? Well, the good news is small businesses are better equipped to exceed customer expectations than these large national retailers. You know, you know your customers, uh, you're, you know, you know what they want, you know their faces, their children, you know, all of these things. Whereas large, big, big box retailers um, are just, you know, putting out information and recirculating it. So how can you really implement some special touches? Maybe it's through packaging, even if it's curbside pickup, if you're packaging up a to-go order, you know, can this specific restaurant drop a little postcard in your to-go package uh, that says scan this QR code to sign up for our e-newsletter for new specials or for a discount? You know, it's always thinking about how can we help the consumer make their way through our brand ecosystem by building brand equity and nudging the consumer closer to the transactions. That's really what we mean by omni-channeling. And then finally, model after retail winners. You know, Clay talked a little bit about national retailers. This is a big, uh, you know, national retail is a big important part of communities. We know that citizens uh, expect amenities. They expect the ability to be able to, to go through a drive-through or go pick up an order at Walmart or whatever it might be, but they crave an experience with small businesses. And so for small businesses, how can you identify who are those national retailers that are most like your business? So for example, if you're a local sporting goods store, maybe it's REI, you know, maybe it's Patagonia, whatever it is, find that brand that you most align with, follow everything that they're doing in the digital realm, sign up for their e-newsletters, um, follow them on social media, watch what they're doing, and you can implement some of those same strategies within your local business. It's all about taking the data and, and using it in a way to enhance the customer experience. So those are our six steps for implementing an omni-channel retail strategy. Now I'm going to toss it back over to Clay to talk about uh, some retail real estate tips. Clay? All right. Thank you, Jeff. So I, I want to give you, you you all some some tips and tricks that I've I've learned through, throughout my career in the industry and just kind of kind of wrote a kind of a getting started manual if you will for if you you know if you were recruiting national retail to to your market because it is there is some misperceptions about it and 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 how best to go about it so you know what what we do at retail strategies we we partner with the municipal with the city with the county. Um, with with the EDA and we we lock arms with them and we are doing this on their behalf. So so Miss Ellie Baker from Magnolia can attest we're we're she's our newest proud partner in the state of Arkansas for retail recruitment and downtown re revitalization. You know we're we're now locking arms with with Magnolia, Magnolia to to really put a plan together to bring new real estate uh, re retail to their market. Um, but I'm gonna kind of give you some tips and tricks that you can use on your own um, if you love her 
you know, like to work with us, we, we'd love to love to do this for you. Uh, but in the meantime, here's here's a couple tips and tricks that uh, that you can put to use. Um, you know, so, you know, if, if I could give you any piece of advice, it would be really just to hone in your elevator pitch. Um, you know, if you're communicating with a retailer or, or, or developer or broker, just understand that they get, they're constantly getting, getting really barraged from every angle. Um, you know, a real estate director for, let's just say Arby's, uh, you know, they probably get two to 300 emails per day, uh, of, of, you know, communities, brokers, developers submitting them sites. So you have to do something to make yourself stand out. And, and I would say the quickest way to, to make your email get deleted really quickly is to send them a whole paragraph on, on why they should be in your market. Really give them the, the bare bone facts about your market. What's, what, what are the drivers? Um, and, and, and just keep it short and, and concise. Brevity would be my, would be my takeaway from that one. Um, you know, the next one would be understand your market weaknesses. Uh, you know, perform a SWOT analysis on your market. Identify your weaknesses and, and put, a, put a plan together of how you can tackle those weaknesses uh, and really sell against your weaknesses. So let's, you know, maybe you have a declining population, but you have a really strong household income. You know, make a case to, make a case to that retailer that, that hey, you, you know, we believe you can hit your sales number because our median household income is more of your consumer group and, and take, take, you know, take the emphasis away from your weaknesses, but it really starts with identifying those weaknesses. So, you know, the, the, the next piece would be, you know, understanding where you are today and where you're going. You know, let's just say that I'm a community of 20,000 and I think, you know, our, uh, you know, I'm a city manager and I get hit, you know, 50 times a day that, hey, we need to target, we need a cheesecake factory, we need a Whole Foods. These are very common issues. Um, but, but you have to understand that, that, you know, the population probably doesn't support that. And you've got some missing gaps in your, in your retail base to build up to that. So it's, you know, it's, it's certainly a process. If, you know, if, if your market, you know, has all the quick service restaurants, but doesn't have that fast casual component, and that's going to be, that's going to be your, you know, your Panera breads, your Chipotle's that th those, those, those in the middle between the quick service and, and, and casual dinings, you know, help build your base up from the fast casual to then leverage yourself and, uh, promote the, uh, the, the casual uh, dining. Um, you know, one, one thing is, you know, all is fair in love and war and also retail recruitment. Uh, don't be scared to reach out to competing markets to, to say, hey, you know, that, that Burger King that's in, in that uh, competing market is owned by a franchisee and, and the market has kind of grown away from that location. And there's no real estate available. Um, you know, the things have happened in the market, you know, so it's, 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 it's not uncommon in, in, in the retail world to, to, to reach out and really poach uh, retailers from the surrounding market. So just don't, don't, don't hesitate on, on reaching out to a retailer just because you think maybe they're, they're too close or too far away from your, your location. You know, look, land banking properties. Uh, you know, it's not one of those things that I would aggressively recommend, but, but if you have an opportunity to, to, you know, take control of a good piece of property in your market, whether that's in your downtown corridor, whether that's in your commercial uh, district, you know, use that as an incentive uh, for, to be a catalyst for growth. So if it's a dilapidated building in your downtown, you have the, you have the funding and, and ability to, to, to purchase that and leverage that for, you know, a catalyst project in your downtown, or let's just say it's a bank branch that closed in your, your commercial corridor that's, that's surrounded by good retail and you, you have the means to, 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 to put that under contract. You then were, are able really to control what happens next with it. Um, so it, it's, it puts you in a powerful position uh, to, to recruit retail if, you, if, you, if you're able to do that. The next would be, you know, cut the red tape. Um, you know, too often cities, cities put too many stipulations and, and, you know, they're, 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 you know, that maybe they have a planning and zoning committee that's just too harsh. Uh, city council approval takes too long. Just really, really think about your processes internally, um, how your approval is, 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 is stated. And, and really, you know, you don't want to get the perception from the retail industry because word gets around and it's a small, it's a small community. Um, you know, if, if your community is historically difficult to get a deal done in or, or you know, the, the developers know that, that if they submit a plan, it's going to get marked up 50 times, time kills all deals. Retailers are going to move on. They're going to move on to your, your neighboring market. So really, really create a path of least resistance uh, for retailers to come in your market. Um, the, the next thing I would say is, is look for value add opportunities. 
you know, this it's really big trend in 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 the commercial real estate world now is to you know value add proposition. You know, so it's very expensive to build a new building these days. I mean, you take a look around the macroeconomics, the price of lumber is up 300%. Um, you know, if that's not inflation, I don't know what is. So, you know, it's very, very difficult to, to build new stores and make and make it work for these retailers because historically, you know, market rent for, for retailers, they're paying about the same thing they were 10 years ago, but the cost of construction has gone up, you know, 500%. So, you know, if you have these opportunities to, to backfill a location in, in your market or in your downtown, really, really leverage those opportunities and, and think creatively, think outside the box of, you know, how can I backfill this, this, you know, fully constructed brick and mortar location that used to be X, but we can turn it into, into Y. So do you, you don't always have to think about retail recruitment in terms of, you know, a new shopping center or a new location. I, you know, I talked earlier about how over retail we are. Really, you know, a, a lot of cities would be would doing themselves a lot of favor to just to reposition assets um, and, and help help control the narrative from that standpoint. And then, then you know, the, the, the next tip would be focus on the sustainable mix of uses. Um, you know, I, I think the traditional retail only shopping center development is really, you know, it's a thing of the past. Um, you know, it's, it's no surprise that indoor enclosed malls are going away. They're, they're being, you know, turned into all, all variety of uses. But really, you know, I think going forward, retail development is going to consist of retail. It's going to consist of a mix of, you know, a healthcare component. Um, you know, you look at Walmart, for instance. Walmart is, is trying to be everything to everybody. They, they are in the process now of converting a lot of their garden centers to, to, to uh, dock in the box clinics or walk in dental, walk in healthcare. Um, they've had movies in their parking lot. They're, you know, they're, they're, Walmart is trying to become the next mall. And I, I think, you know, I think retail development is going to kind of follow suit because, you know, the, Retail alone is not going to drive users to locations. It's going to be a mix and variety of use because Jen talked about it earlier. I mean, it's all about convenience. You really, you really need to get your consumers into the location. And that's 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 by giving them a variety of a variety of uses. The, the next is going to be the target franchisees. So so many of these quick service or, or you know national brands that are that are restaurants, especially, are franchisee driven. So a lot of times, you know, you, you're, you know, traditionally you're talking to a real estate director or talking to a franchise director, which is all well and good. And it's, it's kind of the protocol you have to follow. But at the end of the day, most of these brands are letting the, the franchisee make the decisions on the real estate and also the market. You know, corporate has to approve the market for a franchisee to do a location, but you can cut out a lot of steps and a lot of, a lot of conversations uh, if you target the franchisees. So, so when I'm when I'm working with, with one of our municipalities across the country, you know, I'm I'm looking at those neighboring communities. I'm calling those those businesses in neighboring towns that I know are franchisee driven. I'm looking to say, you know, I'll I'll start by talking to a cashier and say, hey, you know, what what days are your operator? What what days are your, are your owner in? And they'll say, well, they're in Tuesdays from eleven to one. Well, I'll, I'll just write down a note. The next Tuesday between eleven and one, I'm going to call that location to ask for the operator. Um, because if I can get that person on the phone, I can have a real conversation about, you know, what is the, what is the probability of you doing a second, third location? Do you have a commitment to your, to your brand? Are you on your third or fifth store and you just got so behind that, you know, you got one year to find, you know, finalize that, that those additional two location commitments. So we can, you know, you, you can kind of help step in and alleviate maybe some of the stress that they're, they're feeling. And the next is, is one of the, the main things I get asked so often from my clients is, you know, what, what can we do to help? What, what can we do to make our market more attractive to retailers? And, and really, it's, it's very simple, um, not as easy to do, but, but very, it's a very simple principle. It's really just focus on the quality of life. Um, you know, make your, make your cities, you know, walkable. Make, make the, sure the lighting is sufficient. Um, you know, if you have shopping centers with dim lighting, I promise you, your, your consumers are not going to want to shop there after the sun goes down. And, and most of the time, you know, your, your, your working class consumers, they are shopping after working hours. So if you, if you have that shopping center that is dimly lit, uh, the parking lots in, in disrepair, you know, put some pressure on those, put some pressure on those owners to, to really step it up and, 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 and put some initiative and, and money into their centers. Um, you know, remove crime, uh, you know, very difficult to do, easy, easy to say, I know, um, you know, you know, 
and, and really just, you know, think about, uh, again, I'm going to go back to the, to the franchisee model, but if, 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 a, if a business, and you know, it might be a national brand, but at the end of the day, it's going to be a, a, a small business owner that's going to be operating that brand. So that, that Arby's uh, operator might own one to three locations. And, and very likely, if they're opening up in your market, there's a good possibility that they're going to move and they're going to move your family uh, to your community. So you, you want to you make sure that you are, you're creating an environment that, that, that is somewhere that a small business would want to pack up and move to. So those are my, my 10 uh, tips and tricks for, for retail recruitment in your community. I hope that Hope that helps as you you move forward and, and try to attract uh, uh, retailers into your market. Are there any questions for Clay and I? I definitely want to encourage people to ask questions because you got Jen and Clay here, and like I said, they're really experts in this sector um, in retail development, downtown development and recruitment. So please, you can unmute yourself or you can use the chat if needed. Okay. Last, last chance, everybody. Okay, well, um, as we wrap up, um, there is something I always like to do and I wanna do it before I forget. Um, and that is to take a photo of everybody. And if you've been on these before, you should have been expecting that. Um, Clay, if you don't mind to stop sharing your screen so I can get that um, get that going. And everybody, while Clay's uh, moving that off, if you wanna turn on your cameras, we ask you to make yourself pretty for the picture. Come on, I know some other people have turned their cameras on. <laughs> Victoria, get your camera. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. If everybody's ready, I'll count to three and then I'll take a few. So one, two, three, smile. Oh, wait, I got Tim. There you go. We got you in Tim. Well, wait a second. Patrick. Hey, Patrick. Okay. We'll do one more time. One, two, three, smile. Okay. We got a few. Thank you guys. Um, and also before we get off, um, something I'd like for everybody to do, if you can use the chat, um, share um, your favorite small business in your community um, or a small business that you frequently go to or you want to promote in your town. And I'm going to take the chat messages and I'm going to make a list when I send out the follow up email with the recording because um, I travel all over the state. And when I come to your community, I want to go to those businesses and those restaurants. Um, so if everybody can just take a few minutes in the chat, one or two small businesses that you think people need to go to. And I'm gonna shout some of these out. Posley Pe Peddler. Oh, and if you can include where they are too, so I know. Um, House of Mental, what is it? Brittany, what is House of Mental? Brittany, can you hear us? Oh no, Brittany's sound isn't working. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Sorry, this is a this always happens <laughs> for Brittany, but she's with Kristen. It, it's a vegan soul food restaurant. It's really good, and it's African American owned. So cool, that is awesome. Well, I'd never heard of that. Uh, we got uh, Hollis Evans Floral in Camden, Mule Kick in Magnolia. I've been to Mule Kick. It's awesome. The Perfects in Camden, Essential Frills and Cheers in Maumel. This is awesome. These are a great list, guys. Um, thank y'all for doing that. Um, uh, since we're talking about small businesses and how important they are, and like Clay and Jen said, the backbone of our communities, um, I thought that'd be a fun little exercise for us to wrap up with. Um, and like I said, I'll create a bulleted list and share where all these places are. And hopefully if they have a website or a Facebook page, I'll link to those as well. Um, I thought that'd be a great way for us to end. Um, and obviously we'll send out Clay and Jen's contact information. So if you do have a question that maybe was a little more in depth that you didn't want to ask um, on the Zoom, totally okay. You can reach out to them and I know they'll be happy to reply and see if they can help you. Um, with that, everyone, we're going to end a little bit early, uh, which I always like. 
Uh, but we just want to thank you again for being a part of this community conversation session. We do have one more community conversation session uh, before we go into hiatus for the summer as my team starts to prepare for the Community Development Institute. Um, I'll also share information about that in the follow up email. Um, and with that, again, Clay and Jen, thank you guys so much. We really appreciate this presentation. Um, I always learn so much from you guys, and I'm really excited we got to host you as a part of Community Conversations. And with that, just want to say bye, everybody, and have a great weekend. It's only yeah. Tuesday, but have a great week and a great weekend. <laughs> so thanks. thanks for having us. Thank you, guys.